Well, good morning, everybody. For those in our newly forming cafe, good morning to you as well, as well as to those in the lodge. So good to see you this morning. Um, I was really moved by those dedications, uh, just to see those little children um, in David's arms and in their parents' arms, and then the laughter. And what struck me was we're called children of God. We look at that and think, oh, how cute. But there is laughter and joy when we're held by the Father and we're called children of God. And so take that in this morning. It's not just a supporting of them in prayer, but a reminder that you also are a child of God and that he loves you deeply. And we're grateful you're here this morning. Would you say just a brief, or not you say, I'll say it. Would you pray with me just for a moment? So Lord Jesus Christ, we have often found through the failures in our life that there is no value in putting a lot of confidence in ourselves. But we have confidence, Lord, in what you've called us to do and who you've made us to be. So thank you for this morning. And we pray, Father, that your word would speak clearly to people's hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever heard the expression, this person is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good? I think we hear that and we think of people whose heads are way up here, maybe uninvolved or unresponsive to the needs of the world. That a person is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly God. I don't think we have that problem in America. I think we're so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. Can there be anything better in heaven if all the good is here on earth? I mean, I want to see my Red Sox win another World Series again. I gave up sweets for Lent and work out at a Y to get a second look for my wife. <laughs> right now I get one look. <laughs> and I watch another thrilling episode of a cooking show with her on Netflix. Heaven can't come soon enough for me. <laughs> I want to live long enough to hold my grandchildren and maybe get lucky enough to sit in the front row at their weddings. As an honored guest, I'm already emotional with that. <laughs> Most of us want to acquire enough wealth to feel safe, retire, and move to the white sands and blue water. Most of us want to live right enough uh, if we are young enough to get into the right school, marry the right bachelor or bachelorette, build a rocket, and maybe fly to the moon. We've got dreams and we've got aspirations. John Eldridge writes this, nearly every Christian I have spoken with has some idea that eternity is an unending church service. We have settled on an image of a never-ending sing-along in the sky. One great hymn after another, forever and ever, amen. And then our hearts sink. We don't sing very well. And we think, is that the good news? I mean, I love our worship team that's up here on Sundays, but I also love baseball. I like white sandy beaches and my family here on earth. I gave up sweets for Lent, but also realized that donuts are a breakfast food. Don't lose hearts, friends. There is more ahead of us, actually, in heaven than what's behind us on earth. So today, we begin a series called Anticipation. It's on heaven, and I can't wait. I've been all up in heaven this week. I've read three books, a couple of commentaries, and I almost got hit in our parking lot by one of our thrift store managers and had a close encounter. I love my life here on earth, but I know that there is also more ahead of us in heaven than behind us. About two years ago, one of our staff was about ready to embark on an international trip. So I said before one of our staff devotions, we'll pray for you. Just know that you've done a great job, but if you don't make it back, we'll miss you, and we'll see you again soon. I think the only men, amen I got in the room from that was David. <laughs> As we think about the reality of eternal life. 
I was half joking for the shock effect, but also serious for the seriousness of our faith effect. So why is the topic of death and heaven as a destination not talked about very much? We don't like to think about it, and I think it's because death can be heavy and tragic. And if we're not afraid of death, sometimes we just get afraid of getting old. I know it can be full of sorrow and unwelcome if death comes too soon. We truly grieve someone we lose. We were made for eternity, and so I understand that death stings, and sorrow may always be there. But there is hope. There is always hope. I still miss my kin, my friend Ken Headley, who died before many of his friends and family were ready to let him go. But I also know that Ken's family played an upbeat song called Every Praise at His Bedside and through JMU streamers at his memorial service. This was not a denial of death, but an undeniable view of heaven. For Ken, to live was Christ, and to die was gain. Said another way, if we don't look forward to heaven, then we're often enslaved by the promises of earthly gain. More and more and more, and achieving and achieving, and never getting there, just wanting more earthly gain. So could it be that there is more for us in heaven than what will be behind us on earth? Does anybody know what the first recorded words of Jesus were in the Bible? Anybody want to shout it out? He was 12. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? These were the first words of Jesus when he was 12 years old, and now some of the last words of Jesus were written for us in John 14. And we will see that what was first importance to Jesus is now lasting importance to people who may be afraid of death. So we're going to take a look at it this morning in John 14, starting with verse 1. I'm reading from a little bit more of a modern version called the NLT, the New Living Translation, and this is what it says. Friends, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be where I am and you know the way to where I am going. I love this. Sounds like us. No, we don't know, Lord. Thomas said, we have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? And then Jesus told him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you've been around church world for a while or understand the scriptures, you know when Jesus was saying, I am the way, he said, I am the existing one. I was here before the world was born. Every, of everything that exists, I am the most reliable I am the most reliable. Jesus says, I am who I am. I am eternal creator and maker of many rooms. The one who was lifted up on the cross has now risen to the highest heaven and he will come again and he will bring us to the place where there are many rooms. So the first thing we need to see about heaven this morning is Jesus. David Dwight in his sermon, who was up here, our senior pastor, He was giving notes on this series to prepare the worship team and to prepare me for what this should mean. And he says, some would suggest that all our longings are longings for home. Perhaps more likely they are longings for God and we find that God is our home. Make no mistake, Paul Tripp said in a Lenten devotional that I read this morning and I added it to these words, What people feel to realize is that the thing they're looking for is not a thing but a person. The search for treasure is in reality a search for a savior. 
Psalm 90 says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth from the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Don't let that wash over you. Do you see what that means? Before there was anything material, before there was this created world, before the mountains were formed, before there were ocean rivers or streams, before anything else, there was Jesus. Thomas said, we have no idea where you're going, Jesus. But Jesus said, I am the destination. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. I am unfailing love. I am all the glory you'll ever need. I am before all time. In Jesus, we live and we move and we have our being. So for the rest of this sermon, I want to act a little bit as a tour guide to give us a peek at heaven as we understand it from God's word and the world we live in. Maybe our picture of heaven can shape the way we live in the present. Maybe anticipating heaven will be right-sizing things on earth. So I don't wanna make any assumptions. First, we need to say, how do we know that heaven even exists? Have you been there? Now, most surveys tell us that 77% of us believe heaven exists. So I'm going to give you three reasons among many. Of those 77% of us that believe heaven exists, 76% of those believe that they have a good or excellent chance of getting there. I know I'm good enough because I paid for somebody's meal of glory days on Wednesday. But if you read the scripture, I'm not sure that's how it works. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father through their good works, but through me. Now, majority rules does not prove heaven exists. But maybe, as C.S. Lewis suggests, if I find in myself a desire which no no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Now, if you've heard that quote a lot, here's another one. Philosopher Jerry Wall said, a good God would not create us with the kind of aspirations we have and then leave those aspirations unsatisfied. He has given us eternity in our hearts. If you're an Easter person, heaven exists because Jesus was raised from the dead. The tomb where they believe Jesus was buried is empty. In Israel, there's two locations where they believe Jesus may have been buried, and both of those tombs are empty. You may not believe it, but the Bible records that Jesus was not only raised from the dead, but people saw him after his resurrection. And I don't have time to get into it, but a Hebrew narrative, Hebrew oral, oral tradition, which is then recorded, was so reliable. What they saw, they wrote. They saw him after the resurrection. They ate with him, walked with him on a road called Emmaus, and saw him taken up to heaven again, which gives us assurance that there's somewhere else to go. Theologian Scott McKnight says this, there has never been an era in which the church hasn't believed in heaven. And I think that's really significant in a culture always pressing the church to change. The church of Jesus Christ has always stood on the resurrection and the hope of eternal life, and the church has never moved from that place. And finally, beauty. I think even an atheist can be awestruck by the grandeur in our world. Almost heaven, West Virginia. The Rocky Mountains, the coast of Maine, the sound of rivers rushing down from the mountains in the spring. The waterfalls of Niagara Falls, the beauty of the sunrise, or the multi-colored sky at sunset that we pull over to take pictures of. So if if there's this much beauty on earth, it makes sense that God, our creator, will make a whole new world, a whole new creation, even better than the original. 
the Bible says this, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Scott McKnight said the Bible does not give us an HD view of heaven, but it does give us images to stoke the imagination by suggesting what heaven might be like. Arthur Brooks, who wrote a book called Strength to Strength, suggests failing to think about heaven is one of the biggest reasons aging in America is done so poorly. We grieve the idea that it's all over now and the best is all behind us. I understand grieving when we don't want to leave family that we love or friends that we love. But to think that the best is all behind us is not true. Or maybe for the younger generation, there is nothing better in front of us than what we see in the here and now and what I dream about. Maybe we have become so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. So let's try to reverse our course and take a little heavenly pilgrimage this morning. I think there are six things we may see on earth that are not in heaven. Most of these are taken from Daryl Johnson's commentary on Revelation called Discipleship on the Edge. And he got his ideas from the Bible, from Revelation 21 and 22. So what are the six things that we may see on earth that are not in heaven? No chaos in heaven. Revelation 21 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and then it was no longer any sea. We live in a chaotic world. The writer is not saying there's no longer a body of water in the new creation. But in the first century, the sea represented chaos. In the new creation, there won't be chaos. There won't be typhoons, hurricanes, or earthquakes. There won't be car accidents, airline accidents, or people running into our schools with guns. There will only be a sea of glass and peace in the presence of Jesus in the new heaven and the new earth. What else won't be in heaven? No tears or death or crying or pain. You know what that means? No cancer, no migraines, no more glioblastomas, no more grief over the loss of a loved one, no more suicide, no more suffering, no more life robbers when heaven is our home. Here's what else won't be in heaven. No more violence. No injustice. No more teenagers breaking curfew or mom or dad embarrassing them around school. No more lust or alcoholism or anger. No more idols that rob our soul of joy when heaven is our home. Lee Strobel suggests the first hour of heaven will be reconciliation. I love that thought. I know some of you don't think I'm funny, but you'll like me in heaven and I'll like you. (laughs) You might laugh at my jokes. No more rebellion, dishonesty, or hatred for the way you were raised or hurt. In the first hour of heaven, father, son, mother, daughter, sister, brother, relationships will be healed. I feel like I want to say that again for some of you that are so hurting and feel distant from somebody that you love. There won't be any temples in heaven. The temple is where the people of the Old and New Testament encounter God. But the Bible says in heaven we will see Jesus face to face. The whole new city, the whole new heaven is called the dwelling place of God. No longer a need for a temple. We may see the sun and moon for beauty's sake, but the glory of God will be the only light we need when heaven is our home. What else won't be in heaven? Revelation 21, 25 said the gates of this new city in heaven will never be closed. 
There are no closed gates in heaven. There are no jails. There are no gated communities. In heaven, our ethnic diversity will display the glory of God, but not define us. Our relationship together in Christ will be all that matters when heaven is our home. And in heaven, there will be no curse. You ever feel like you're just having more bad days than good ones? I think it's the world and somehow our identity that curses us, but God never does. In heaven, there will be no curse. The new city is set free from slavery, futility, and frustration. The new heaven and the new earth will all be about mercy and love and recreation, and nothing will exist outside of what God creates, and we'll be invited to join him when heaven is our home. Dallas Willard puts it this way. We will not sit around looking at one another or, or at God for eternity, but we'll join the eternal logos in the endlessly ongoing creative work of God. A part of, I think, what that means is that Teslas are barely cool cars, but imagine a form of transportation designed by God. I'm not even sure we'll need an electric power car. We may be able to get place to place at the snap of a finger or the wink of an eye. There is more ahead of us in heaven than what's behind us, friends. The new heaven and earth, the Bible says, will be full of tangible stuff. Fruit trees, rivers, seas of glass, and not turmoil. The best wine, save for last. Earth stuff, untainted and imperishable bodies, imperishable bodies that won't decay. And as you get older, I can't wait for that. So what do we do in the meantime? Episcopal priest Tis Warren gives voice to this, and she says, sickness, both slight and serious, is a diminishment of the glory for which we were made. The lush flavor of life replaced by the steel, stale fluorescent of a hospital room or the dimness of a bleary day in bed. But our bodies will be made eternal. They will rise from the dead in fleshly solidity, their glory permanently undiminished. My father, my earthly father has lived a full and good life. He would say he is closer to heaven than earth. My dad often speaks of my mom in heaven and my little brother who died as an infant. And he can't wait to see them again. All my dad cares about now is spending time with family. Sometimes when my dad and I are driving around, <clears throat> he asks me, what's that song that our pastor, Dr. Halverson, used to sing at the end of the evening worship services? And I say, Dad, I think you remember. <laughs> but he just wants me to keep saying it. So more often than not, as bad as I am, I'll sing it to him. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on thee. When the darkness comes and shadows fall, he gives us perfect peace. And Dad just looks at me and smiles. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Maybe we should be more heavenly minded so we can do more earthly good. To live more full and hopeful lives. Really hopeful. And to tell everyone there is more ahead of us in heaven than behind us on earth. To tell people through our life and our action and our joy that heaven is our home. There is a better place. Our Father in heaven is welcoming. And this will be our homecoming. We're going to close with a song this morning that we'll sing on Easter Sunday morning, Resurrection Day. This is almost like a little heaven practice for our community that we might share with others to come the joy 
that we have in Jesus Christ even here on earth.